And that brings us to the analysis of Shields and Brooks. That is syndicated columnist Mark Shields and New York Times columnist David Brooks, who joins us tonight from Aspen, Colorado. And hello to both of you. We're going to talk about the 2020 candidates, but first I want to ask about Robert Mueller. Uh, Mark, he spent, what, almost five hours mm -hmm. before two House committees this week. What's the main story that we should take away from what he had to say? Uh, Robert Mueller was Robert Mueller. Uh, he was, uh, he's that rarest of uh, uh, public figures in uh, Washington, D.C., uh, a man uh, who, with no detectable uh, political agenda. He refused to be a political prop uh, for the Democrats who wanted him to read the report aloud. Uh, he refused to go after uh, Donald Trump, uh, who has savaged him uh, personally and accused him of uh, uh, being uh, unfair and prejudiced and uh, fake news and running a hoax and a witch hunt. Uh, never responded in kind. Um, and I thought, uh, I, I thought he uh, did the rare thing in Washington, which was to present his case. Uh, he left us, uh, uh, certainly, we have, on this broadcast, David and I have agreed in the past that the Russia thing seemed to be the weakest link of any of the criticisms of uh, Trump. And Donald, uh, if anything, Bob Mueller made the case compellingly, uh, and uh, really to the point where I, I think he left Republicans on the defensive very much on that. David uh, made the case compellingly? Of uh, Russian interference, he certainly made that case very compellingly. He, uh, it was a calm performance, but he had his hair on fire about the ongoing nature of uh, Russian interference in the American electoral system. Uh, there was no collusion, and I, I, I think the, the headline on that front is that it makes it much less likely that we move forward with an impeachment process. There are still people in the House who are sort of angling in that direction. Uh, and there's been a lot of fantasy that we'd get what they call a Dewis S. Mueller, a, a hidden hand to remove Donald Trump. But it's looking much more likely that's going to be with the work of the election. And in retrospect, I'm out here um, in Colorado with people from all over the world. And a, one young man from uh, South Africa said to me, you know, our democracy is 30 years old. Your democracy is really old. And one of the things we've learned from you and in our own experience is that when people elect a leader to be president or head of the country, it should be really hard for people in the nation's capital to take him or her out. Uh, that's just not great for democracy. And our system did make it very hard to take a president out for even, you know, the corruptions and the, the sins we've seen Donald Trump commit. Uh, they want to invest power in the people, and, and there's some solace, I think, in that. And yet, uh, Mark, uh, yes, Speaker Pelosi is saying uh, we're not there yet. It's not mm -hmm. the moment That's right. to decide on impeachment. And yet, as Lisa Desjardins was reporting uh, tonight, the House Judiciary Committee already using the term impeachment investigation as they go after more information from the White House and the Justice Department. That's right, Judy. And I, and I think it's absolutely understandable they would proceed. I, I couldn't disagree more with David about collusion. I mean, I don't think there's any question that what came through clear and loud and repeatedly uh, in Bob Mueller's uh, presentation was that the Trump administration, the Trump, Donald Trump himself, his campaign, and those who worked for him cooperated at every opportunity. Now, we can call, get in a question about what's collusion and what isn't, but they were actively involved. I mean, to the point of sharing polling figures and uh, strategy and, and, and all the rest of it. So, uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of fascinating that, and then the Republicans, in the, in the Senate, uh, led by Mitch McConnell, uh, refused to even address any response, any meaningful response uh, to, uh, to election security, as we discussed earlier in this broadcast. I mean, the Republicans seem bound to determine to keep Americans from participating in elections, uh, but they, uh, they're reluctant to keep re Russians from participating. What about, subverting. excuse me, what, sure. what about that, David, uh, the fact that you did get a, you did get a clear sense from listening to, to Robert Mueller, as both of you have said, that the Russians not only were very active in 2016, that they're still active, and, and we expect them to be going into this, this next election, and yet Republicans are not allowing uh, election security legislation to move ahead. You've got both parties, frankly, pointing fingers at, at each other. Yeah, I would invite Republicans to take a look at the globe and see that there's a lot of countries that could get involved in American in election interference. Right now it's Russian. I guess the, Mitch McConnell thinks it's somehow good for the Republicans. That, to me, is probably not true. It's probably just bad for democracy. 
But, you know, Donald Trump has been pretty tough on China. I suppose China decides to get involved in interfering in our elections in a way that hurts Donald Trump. The fact is, interfering in elections is just a, an act of war a, on the country. That's... And the idea that an act of war should be greeted by state and local responses is, to me, an absurdity. And that argument that our elections are handled on a, on a state uh, basis is, is just not an argument that I understand the historical precedent, but it's not an argument that's in any way commensurate with what's actually happening. And David's right. David is right. It's a it's a national security. There is there's no more important national act than a national election choosing a president. And to uh, say that the good people of Maricopa County, Arizona, uh, are responsible uh, and, and they are responsible for running their elections. But this is a national security. It's our national interest. And anybody meddling, it's not a question of even cyber response or anything of the sort. It's a it's a, it has to be a response of national security uh, response. But just quickly to go back to the, to both of you on this question of, of impeachment, as these members of Congress go home to their districts and their states mm -hmm. over the August recess, is it your expectation, Mark and David, that they're going to come back and say, forget this, or that this could still be alive, will still be alive in September? Yeah, I, I, you know, if the presidential candidates who are out on the trail every day with, with Democratic voters were talking about the Russia uh, thing, then I would think maybe there's a chance that that will happen. But they are certainly not talking about that, and they don't particularly want to talk about that. They want to talk about the issues that are on voters' minds. Now, there's still some people in some districts, there are about 100 House Democrats who do want to proceed. But to me, what happened today with the, the continuing the investigation is very much in line with what Nancy Pelosi has said all along. She doesn't want to go to the country unless there's an ironclad case. And if you just want to reduce it to one sentence, Watergate, everybody understood what Richard Nixon did. There was a cover-up of a break-in. Uh, there's never been that one-sentence case. And there's been a lot of terrible things Donald Trump has done, most of them out in public. Uh, but there's never been that one-sentence case that would, that would, I think, impel a lot of people to suddenly start caring about impeachment right now rather than just go to the election. Well, let's turn to the 2020 candidates, Mark. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as we heard in, in that report, from again, from Lisa just before this, they are, we're hearing sharper disagreements out there. Joe Biden uh, going after Cory Booker after Cory Booker went after Joe Biden. Biden pointing out his differences with Kamala Harris. Are we seeing something materially different in this uh, 2020 contest or not? Well, if you're Cory Booker and you're back in the pack uh, going after the front runner, Joe Biden gets you covered. Uh, and get your coverage. Uh, I'm not saying it was a, a synthetic dispute, but I mean that's it, it's a it's a proven tactic to do it, Judy. Th there's there's got to be differences. There's going to be competition. I, uh, it, 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 the risk of throwing a little cold water at this point four years ago, 75 to 15, Hillary Clinton led Bernie Sanders before losing New Hampshire by 20 points, and Donald Trump was at one percent, and Ted Cruz was at four percent, leading the Republican race. Scott, was Scott Walker second behind <laughs> Jeb Bush and just ahead of Mike Huckabee. So, uh, you know, I, I just, I really think that what we're seeing is a sorting out more than anything else at this point. Did you really have to remind us about those polls from... Well, I just, I think it's, you know, I think it's something to bear in mind. Just a little perspective. For, for some Republicans, those were the good old days, by the way. <laughs> so, David, uh, what, what do you see developing or not among these Democratic candidates right now? The first thing is, is how, because some, everybody's so intensely involved, it doesn't feel like the kind of campaign that's going to be won by doing a lot of town halls in New Hampshire or a lot of barbecues in Iowa. It feels like a national campaign already, where the, there's huge social media buys, where the TV uh, appearances and the debates really matter, where the local Iowa New Hampshire polls look a little like the national polls. Uh, and so that's one thing that's kind of interesting to me. I am surprised by how tough they are on each other. I'm especially surprised by how strong, frankly, the candidates have le on the left have been toward Biden, and frankly, how much hostility there is in that part of the party to Biden. To me, it w if he emerges as the nominee, I think he'll have a lot more work than almost anybody, except for maybe Bernie Sanders in the party, to unify the party. Uh, there really is a lot of hostility there that goes back to a lot of things, and mostly just a desire not to go back to the Obama years. And the final thing is, if Biden is not the moderate, uh, nom in the moderate lane, I don't know who Plan B is. Uh, there's been no other clearly defined moderate who has emerged, neither Michael Bennett uh, nor maybe Amy Klobuchar is the c ones who come closest, but I don't really see a strong plan B on that side of the, of the party. Mark, do you think uh, Joe Biden has the moderate lane locked, locked up? 
I, I think he certainly dominates the, the moderate lane right now, Judy. But I think that as far as party unity is concerned, uh, there's, a, there's just an absolute miraculous guaranteed party unit fire. And his name is Donald Trump. Um, and whoever the Democratic nominee is, uh, I, I, short of his, uh, you know, turning out to be an abuser of small animals, uh, he's, uh, he or she will have the unified support of Democrats. Last thing I want to touch on with both of you, and that is, you know, lo and behold, we saw the two parties come together this week, David, and agree on a budget uh, for the coming year. Now, this is just an outline. It's a blueprint. It doesn't mean that's what we're going to spend. But it happens to include a $1 trillion deficit. Uh, both parties, Democrats and Republicans, signing on to this. Uh, what's happened to worry about red ink? Well, the Republican Party is no longer the party of, of balanced budget amendments and things like that. Donald Trump began to walk away, and then the party has followed at a gallop. Uh, both parties can agree on one thing. They love giving away free stuff, and they're giving away a lot of free stuff. And some of it may be good, and some of it may be bad. But the, the winners here are Nancy Pelosi, who got a lot more spending on domestic discretionary spending. She got more of that than on Pentagon spending, which ha had been the rule in the Obama years. You keep them 50-50. And Trump, to the extent that... Um, he uh, has a lot of money, to, stimulus money, to throw around in an election year. It might boost the economy. Uh, the losers, I would say, are Generation Z, who are going to have to pay this off somehow. Uh, and so uh, this has been the deterioration of our budget system for the past 20 years, I guess. 30 seconds. Uh, Judy, the Democrats were roasted as the tax and spend party. The Republicans turn out to be the tax cut and spend party. Uh, make no mistake about it. Uh, this, is a, this is a party that if hypocrisy were a felony, the Republicans would do a hard time about a balanced budget constitutional amendment. Um, they, have, they have cut this to the, to the point where uh, it, we, the last time we had 3% economic growth, Barack Obama was president. Revenues went up by 7% that was collected by the government because of the tax cuts that Donald Trump imposed and passed with the co cooperation of the Congress. 3% growth resulted in a 1% diminution in revenues. That's what David's talking about, that the next generations are going to have to deal with and the burden. We'll let that sink in. Mark Shields, David Brooks, thank you both.